as a world-class research intensive university, this institution has different platforms that enable its stakeholders to share research findings. Alumni Lectures, one of such platforms, is a collaboration between the university and its alumni association. Today, we are very proud to have a distinguished alumnus, Ambassador D.K. Osei, mount this platform to share experience and findings from his career and research. To kickstart the program, please join me to welcome the chairperson for the University of Ghana Alumni Association, Ms. Doris Ansa, to deliver welcome and introductory remarks. Please join me to welcome. Ambassador D.K. Osei, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nana Abba Apia Amfu, Pro Vice Chancellors, Ministers of State, Members of Parliament, Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Faculty and Senior Members, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, Fellow Alumni of the University of Ghana, my dedicated Council Members, Equifo Hall alumni, Akuras, teachers and students of Hachimota School, teachers and students of Presbyterian Boys Senior High School. Good evening. I bring you greetings from the Alumni Association of the University of Ghana, and on their behalf, welcome you to the 34th Alumni Lecture. We are happy you found time once again to be with us, and we wish to thank you most sincerely for honoring our invitation. The University of Ghana, as most of us are aware, is celebrating its 75th anniversary, which was launched in August this year. Series of activities have been lined up for the year-long celebration, and we are therefore encouraging all alumni worldwide to fully participate and also contribute your quota to your alma mater. This year, June, I was also elected into office with my fellow executives as the fifth and first female chairman to stir, thank you, to stir the affairs of the association for the next two years. We therefore have a lot to be thankful for and I need all your support. The alumni lectures since its inception have been one of the main highlights on the university and alumni calendars, where lecturers are selected from amongst alumni of the university who have distinguished themselves in their respective professions and the world of work, addressing various topics spanning governance, education, business, science, to mention a few. The lectures seek to highlight issues that directly impact the body politics of this nation. Over the years, the alumni lectures have been privileged to have hosted the following distinguished lecturers. The late Henry V. H. Sechi in 1974. You see, we've come a long way. 1974, he was the first lecturer. Mrs. Mary Chinrihesi, our current chancellor, Dr. Mrs. Sylvia Boyd, the matrix of the Alumni Association. By the way, her number is UGAA5. And she also gave the 50th anniversary lecture. Her ladyship, Professor Henry Tamen Sabuzu. Honorable Professor Aaron Michael Okwe, former Speaker of Parliament. The Chairman of the University Council, Her Ladyship Justice Sophia Kufu and Dr. Ernest Addison, Governor of the Bank of Ghana, just to mention a few. Last year, we were honored to host Honorable Akosia Frema Oseopari, the Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, on the topic, the Chief of Staff, the Chief of Staff of the Republic of Ghana, on the topic, social protection in Ghana, are we on track? This year, we are privileged to have Ambassador D.K. Osei, a former diplomat, 
and Secretary to Cabinet under former President John Ejekum Kufuo with over 40 years experience in conflict management to speak to us on the topic, liberal democracy, the new utopias, and the age of disorder. Hardly a day passes without one conflict or the other being mentioned on our continent and the world at large, where the citizenry have openly defied the po political hierarchy. We therefore look forward to a very stimulating and thought-provoking lecture. It is my hope that the conversation will not end with a lecture, but rather become a topical issue, which will be taken up by our friends in the media for further interrogation. Our chairman for this august occasion is no other than our own mama and landlady, Professor Nana Abba Apia Amfo, Vice Chancellor of our great university. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the Alumni Association has over the years undertaken various projects in support of infrastructure development on the university campus. When the university attained 50 years, the alumni built a new hall of residence, now Jubilee Hall. This really helped with the accommodation problems on campus. A construction of Mother's Wing, a hostel at the university hospital for mothers whose children are on admission. I must say that prior to the construction, mothers were sleeping on benches and under the trees all at the mercy of the weather and mosquitoes. We've also done a refurbishment of the eye clinic also at the university hospital, renovation of reading rooms of four halls of residence. This is an ongoing project, which all the other halls will, will, will be followed. Instrumenta for the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, the beautification of George Bennett Circle, which has recently been retrofitted by the Bennett family. I am so sure that you all saw the beautiful fountains and flowers and the well manicured logs as you entered our prestigious university. In line with the Vice Chancellor's program for enhancing the student experience through digitalization, modernization of classrooms, one student, one laptop, hotspot comfort zone, the alumni is poised to help the Vice Chancellor's program succeed. The Council has therefore decided to build two hotspot comfort zones and more if we are able to raise enough funds. The, the provision of the hotspot comfort zones around the campus is to give students access to washrooms and a place to relax in between classes. This will help improve and enhance the academic futures. Additionally, these zones will be equipped with Wi-Fi and other digital technologies to enable students make the best use of their free time. The association is also building a garden of fame at our alumni center. I don't know how many of you know where the center is, but where the Echo Bank is, that is our alumni center. So, alumni, corporate bodies, stakeholders, and individuals we pay just a small amount and have their names engraved in the Garden of Fame. Just picture it. What a joy and beauty to have your name or company's name engraved in G-O-L-D, gold. So please don't miss out. The Alumni Association, through its dedicated council members, have a lot of projects on the drawing board to help develop the investing. All these are capital intensive, and we need your financial support. We therefore call on all alumni and stakeholders to come on board once again in giving yet another befitting gift to the university as we celebrate 75 years of excellence in becoming the nation's hope and glory and a premier university. Donating cash or in kind or issue checks contribute in whichever way possible towards this course. You can also pledge. We have available pledge forms. Do please pledge, and we will do the follow-up. 
We would also like to use this opportunity to invite all of you who have as yet not become members of the Alumni Association to fill membership forms and be part of us. Associate with UG. By this, you will be pledging your lifelong support to the university. Associate with UG. We also thank the Vice Chancellor and her administration for their support towards this event. Our sincere gratitude goes to our sponsors, Bank of Ghana, GOIL, GCB Bank, Volta River Authority, Consolidated Bank of Ghana, Universal Merchant Bank, Sunu Assurance, ZPay, Stambik Bank, ADB Bank, KPMG, Back Press, and Ambassador of Aridonko of Le County Water. Not forgetting our Midna partners, Graphic Communications Group, Multimedia Group, Radio Universe, Western Publications, Daily Guide, and City FM. In conclusion, I wish to welcome you all once again. I am confident that this lecture will be insightful and provide a good learning platform for us all. Thank you, and God bless us all. Show appreciation to the alumni council chairperson. It is now my pleasure as we proceed to invite our registrar, Mrs. Emilia E.J. Mensa, to introduce the chairperson for this program. Please let's welcome Mrs. Emilia J. Mensa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our chairperson is the first female vice chancellor of the University of Ghana. She's a, a professor of linguistics and an experienced university administrator with over 20 years experience in the higher education sector. She has built her experience in governance through attendance of formal management and leadership programs, as well as on the job training here in Ghana and in various places around the world. She brings a lot of innovation and resourcefulness to her position as vice chancellor, and she's adept at change management. She's a member of many prestigious societies and organizations and is a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's the founding president of the African Humanities Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor Nanaba Apia Amfu, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana and Chairperson for this evening's lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Registrar, for your kind introduction. Our distinguished lecturer, Ambassador D.K. Osei, members of the University Council, Pro Vice Chancellors, Registrar, Provost Deans and Directors, Chairperson and members of the University of Ghana Alumni Association Council, former university officials here present, heads of corporate institutions, cherished alumni of the university, faculty, staff, and students, invited guests and dignitaries present, members of the diplomatic corps, the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, here in the Great Hall and those joining us across our social media platforms. I wish you a very good evening. Oh, good evening. <laughs> Thank you. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all warmly to the 2022 Alumni Lecture 
which happens to be the 32nd alumni lecture on the occasion of the University of Ghana's 75th anniversary. Over the past decades, proud alumni of this prestigious university who have distinguished themselves in their respective fields of endeavor have mounted this platform and shared riveting and instruct instructive presentations from the audience. And the topics have cut across multiple disciplines in consonance with the many alumni that we have trained across a number of disciplines. And this has ranged from finance and economics, governance, education, national development, health and religion, among others. A key feature of the alumni lectures are the, is the intriguing topics as what will be delivered this evening. And this often sets participants wondering what to expect. Now, just to uh, remind us, I'd like to share with you a few of the topics that we have had. Just take you down memory lane since the inception of the alumni lectures in 1974, especially as this is our anniversary year. And so, I don't know how many of you recall getting the economy moving, a layman's view. That was in 1981. Maybe it's time for us to bring back that lecture. Recognition, and that was by Professor George Bene. Recognition of achievement, a tool for national development. That was in 1998. And that was delivered by Dr. Mrs. Sylvia Boy. And she's a regular patron, not just of our public lectures, but of all our activities, and we are happy to have her here this evening, too. We've had air, water, place, people, and health. That was delivered by Professor K. Frimpong Watting in 2002. That was before SARS, COVID, Ebola, and all. And then, I clearly remember this one, Vaccines and Public Anxiety by Dr. Anefi Asamoah Ba in 2015. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you agree with me, those of you who have participated in our past lectures, that they have been very relevant. And in today's lecture, Ambassador Daniel Kufuor say, one of the astute diplomats within the West African sub-region, whose foreign service career spans over four decades, a former secretary to ex-president Kufuor and proud alumnus of this university, go carry the audience through a lecture titled Liberal Democracy, the New Utopias and the Age of Disorder. As I read through his abstract, I had no doubt that we would be treated to a captivating presentation. The lecture would provide the framework to critically analyze the theory and practice of liberal democracy, which supposedly is largely considered as the ideal form of government. I believe the lecture will shed some light on the woes and wings of the system of governance. And I hope that many of our students are online. They are on vacation, but they are online listening to us, particularly our political science students. With this information age comes a new demand and approach to running liberal democracies. Citizens no longer wait till an election period to express their opinion on how well nations have been run. Hopefully, at the end of the lecture, we will be able to come to a firm conclusion of what liberal democracy is indeed, or whether liberal democracy is indeed the ideal form of government for all nations, or it is time to go back to the drawing board as captured in the abstract. Now, before I take my seat, I'd like to inform you that as part of activities marking the University of Ghana's 75th anniversary, 
A number of public lectures on topical issues of national, national concern have been planned. Kindly refer to pages 16 and 17 of the program brochure for details and block the, those dates. We also have our beautiful logo outside and please do take photographs with the logo and post them online. Professor Yanka, I'll be looking out for your Facebook post with the logo. Uh, Nana Bene, I'll be expecting your tweets, your tweets on that. And as for Dr. Ibn Chambers, I'll be expecting his Instagram post. Please join us as we engage in these constructive dialogues in a quest to work towards national development collectively. Thank you for your attention and for making time to join us this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Madam Chairperson and Vice Chancellor. Please let's show appreciation to her once more. At this point, I invite you all to relax as we take a musical interlude from the Ghana Dance Ensemble.
Many thanks to you, Ghana Dance and Sam, for the beautiful Adwa dance. Thank you very much. Before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge some personalities with us. We have here with us His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambers, who served as Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for West Africa and Head of the UN Office for West Africa. We thank you so much for joining us. We also have the MD of GCB Bank PLC, Mr. Kofi Adumaku. Also here with us, we have Professor Kwesi Yanka, former Pro Vice Chancellor of this university. <laughs> Prof. Yanka. And we are also privileged to be joined by our former registrar, Mr. A.T. Ikonu. We also have members of the UG Alumni Association Council seated here with us. Can you please give us a wave? We'll continue with the acknowledgments as we proceed. At this point, I would like to invite Pao Kwesi Yanki, Chairman of the Alumni Lecture Committee, to introduce our distinguished lecturer for this evening. Please let's welcome Pao Kwesi Yanki. Chairperson, Honorable Nayoko Bochum, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, who is also here with us. <clears throat> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to associate myself with the protocols which have been laid out before I got onto this podium. Ambassador D.K. Osei, Daniel Kufo Osei, D.K. Osei Kufo, Joe Jibie. He is the inaugural president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Ghana. Prior to that, he was diplomat in residence at the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy, Lexiad, of the University of Ghana. A diplomat for 40 years, he was also between 2000 and 2008 secretary to the President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency John Ejekum Kufo. In that capacity, he was a member of cabinet, the economic management team, and diplomatic advisory, and on the diplomatic advisory council. Ambassador Osei has been involved in a number of conflict management crises in West Africa and the African continent. He also worked and traveled with two other Ghanaian leaders around the five continents on diplomatic engagements. During his career, he served in Paris, that's between the years 1984 to 1988, Conakry in 1992 to 1996, Kinshasa, 1998 and Copenhagen 1998 to 2001. His experiences in conflict management cover countries such as the Diplomatic Republic of Congo, the Gambia, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, amongst others. He has worked with the first generation of Ghanaian Foreign Service officers 
from Kwame Nkrumah's time. He has received several awards, including the commander of the Order of Moyo by the government of Togo, the Order of Volta Companion Division by the government of Ghana, and the Order of Gravenhaag by Her Royal Highness, the Queen of the Netherlands. Ambassador Osei attended Achimota School and proceeded to the University of Ghana to study for a bachelor's degree. He did his postgraduate courses in international relations at the Institute International Administration Public and also obtained the diploma at Superior Specialize from the Sorbonne, both in Paris. I suppose I've done justice to the French. <laughs> Ambassador D.K. Osei, in 1972, was the SRC president of the University of Ghana. And he, at the time, from the, in the 70s, was a great sportsman and time on campus. And in Achimota School, he was voted twice as sportsman of the year at the University of Ghana. And the record he set in those days, the early 70s in the triple jump, still stand to, and it's yet to be broken. This is decay for you. Also, the record that he set in triple jump during the entire African universities in Dakar is also yet to be broken. Who else? Who else do we have, have we chosen but an essential and consummate diplomat? Ambassador Daniel Osei Kufo Osei decay to be a lecturer for this year. My brother-in-law, my friend that I see every week from the late sixties to date. Ambassador DK Osei DK. University of Ghana Alumni Association. It is in Biatua. I have a boy on my can crawl. And you are my year, dear. I'm an abuel and I'm a four. And I'm a chinchin. I'm a cobanesa. Ambassador DK Osei Osei Bedi Aku Osei Sheho Any any bonus 
and only a customer for a few beers or a the vice chancellor of the University of Ghana. Vice-Chancellors, Provosts, Deans, Members of Faculty, uh, Madam Doris Ansar, President of the Alumni Association, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'm particularly pleased that uh, my dear friend Ayoko, the Foreign Minister, could join us today. Knowing that uh, she was working till 3 a.m. this morning, I was wondering if you could make it. I got thanks for joining us. <laughs> Madam Chair, for me, it's always humbling to return to my familiar grounds that is the University of Ghana. But before I start, I wish first and foremost to thank the Alumni Association for the honor done me in inviting me to deliver the speech. When I listened to the list of speakers, I suddenly realized that that was, I was probably punching above my weight. So I look like I'm most grateful to you. And each time I set foot on this campus, I tend to remember very fondly our days on campus. And I noticed many of those who were here with me are here today, particularly the most active ones, the troublesome ones like Dr. Chambers, Isaac Hussein, when I say the troublesome ones, uh, I'm referring to the active political activity which we were fortunate to have witnessed as student leaders when I was SRC president, uh, Dr. Chambers and I worked very closely together. In the period that we were fortunate to be on campus, this also happened to be a time when the ideological battle, which I'm going to be speaking about, was very active on campus. And I remember some of the professors, Tolson, Yao Safu, P.A. Bianca. Then there were also the Akila Pass and Kwesi Bofi. So we as young men fully benefited from that environment. And so indeed I find myself very fortunate uh, to have been invited to discuss one of the most important uh, systems of governance of our day. As I reflect on my years of work, I've come to accept that the political governance system which a country conducts its affairs, whether it's autocracy, monarchy, theocracy, or liberal democracy, hugely impacts its development, the attitude of its citizens, and the prosperity of its people. I therefore find 
this invitation a rare opportunity and I hope that by the time I'm done I would have done uh, justice to the subject. The title of my lecture, Liberal Democracy, New Utopias and the Age of Disorder is taking place at a time when the world is undergoing profound geopolitical changes and all these changes are beginning to cause realignments that in my view could mark the, mean, the beginning of a totally new international order. The controversy over whether liberal democracy is failed or not is not a loss of me. However, I have no intention, like Pontius Pilate, to uh, be at the center of this uh, controversy. I wash my hands of that debate, and I have no intention of passing judgment in this lecture. I will merely be inviting you to look at the fault lines and the way liberal democracy has functioned since uh, the late 80s, early 90s, and ask you to reflect with me on if there is indeed a need to go back to the drawing board and to start thinking about forms of governance which will respond to the needs and aspirations of the citizens of their countries. I seek to assess the historical circumstances that gave birth to modern democracy, among other competing ideas, the ideals that it promises, and whether the practice of those ideals has held steadfast over the years or requires some adjustments in view of the changing environments we find ourselves in now. Specifically, I argue that the very achievements of liberal democracy constitute its strongest fault lines. Today, most liberal de de democracies are in trouble from the dissatisfaction of citizens I'm talking about the delivery gap. Citizens' expectation for participation in governance and made a changing redefinition of where decision-making should take place. Because traditionally, citizens will elect governments. And until the advent of technology, the advent of uh, new forms of communication, many governments had the pleasure and the privilege of just waiting for another four or five years to, for elections. This is no longer the case. It is no longer the case all over the world. And governments were generally empowered to take decisions and they were to be assessed every four or five years. Again, the speed of information and disinformation with a vast universe of social media and groups which want to take advantage of the power of the information and global financial integration to compete for power. And the, this competition is between them and the governing elites, or in the case of populists, nationalists, and religious fundamentalists, who are trying to subvert liberal democracy and remake the state in their own image. I also argue that if each of these groups offers new utopias that the liberal state is failing to accomplish, particularly its inability to ensure social mobility, its inability to address growing inequality, its inability to restore social protection, and finding a balance between progress and the survival of our ecosystem. Surprisingly, the factors driving these new groups seeking to subvert liberal democracy are indeed a result of the political economy of liberal democracy. Globalization, automation, the nature of work, the changing nature of work, artificial intelligence, social media, and the historical burden of changing systems without going through a revolution. And so as I go through this presentation, I want the following questions to be on your mind with the hope that together we may find answers at the end of the lecture. First question is, is it the case 
that the transformation needed, if any, would require a new system of democracy? Second question that I'd like to ask with you is what would that new system of democracy be? How would it look like? And how can societies build consensus for that change? Ladies and gentlemen, I have organized my thoughts into three main parts to keep you with me in the, on this journey. In the first part, I discussed the Second World War and the competition of political ideologies which followed the armistice. I assessed separately how African countries experimented with these competing ideologies after seeking independence. In the second part, I examined the period after the Cold War and new predictions for the future outlook of countries' political systems, including the prediction of Francis Fukuyama, author of The End of History in the Last Man, who famously predicted the lasting triumph of liberal democracy in the, in the new century. In the third part, I proceed to describe the manifestation of Fukuyama's prediction, and then I explore the spread of liberal democracy and the challenges its propagation faces. I further assess the practice of liberal democracy, its key tenets, and the emerging assertion that liberal democracy is failing. Finally, I discuss the popular emerging or some popular emerging alternatives, the way forward, and then I make concluding remarks on the subject. And I'd like to speak briefly about post-Cold War, Second World War, and the competition for ideologies. As a result of lessons learned from the Second World War, the US and the Soviet Union recognized that the Second World War was disintegrating the prevailing global balance of power, giving them each the opportunity to re-engineer the political and economic order in several countries which were afflicted by the war. To gain more influence globally, historically known as the Cold War, the race between liberal democracy and communism thus began in earnest with the US determined to curtail the spread of communism and promote liberal democracy as the best form of government. Between these two superpowers, the geopolitical tension caused other countries who were undesirous of being drawn into another war to form the Northern Line movement. In Africa, World War II had kindled a new level of political awareness and consciousness among nationalist movements. The conscription of African forces to fight for their colonial masters pierced the cloak of invincibility that Africans first had for so long regarded their colonial masters with. And this is uh, better described by Vincent Capoya in one of the books which I list in the uh, document, which I hope you can refer to. Beyond the self-found awareness among Africans, the justifications for Europe and Britain for resisting German imperialism presented a dialectic challenge for their maintaining of colonies after the war. And the question they asked was that, after all, if it was wrong for Germans to rule Europe and Britain, then why should Britain and France rule Africa? But because of the raw materials, availability of markets. It took some of these uh, colonial masters the painful road of having to go through military action, some incidents of violence as the 48 rounds to force Britain to rel rel relinquish its hold on uh, parts of its colony. France in particular was particularly reluctant uh, to give up, as I will be explaining later. In this environment, African countries which managed to gain their independence were immediately thrown into the raging ideological war between the US and the Soviet Union, a choice between liberal democracy and communism. And many of the African countries who attained independence 
did not achieve political stability immediately after independence. The experimentation by Africans of which political system would secure prosperity for them remained, remained a roller coaster throughout uh, the Cold War. And maybe Ghana's own uh, experience typifies this rolling experiment. Remember, we started with democracy. We transitioned to a one-party state, which was tilting towards socialism. We experienced military junctures. We returned to multi-party democracy, more military junctures, and finally, back to multi-party democracy. All this within the period of the Cold War. Now, Africa's journey Even though other political systems existed, such as Islamism and traditional monarchies in the Arab world, the widespread Now, the desperation of these superpowers to court African countries, partly brought about the divisions uh, which led to uh, Moravia, Casablanca, Libreville. And as a result of these ideological differences, these groups, Casablanca, Moravia, Libreville, tended to have postures which had an impact on which side of the ideological battle they were going to be. And this also affected our march to some form of unity as you would have noticed during the 63 OU conference, where there were vast differences in what approach we're going to adopt. Uh, surprisingly, by 1991, when the USSR was formally dissolved, a series of revolutions had resulted in the overthrow of almost all the communist parties in the Eastern Bloc. A situation that left the US as the only remaining superpower with a concomitant results that democracy and capitalism had trumped communism. This is when Fukuyama uh, emerged. He was an analyst at the US State Department and his argument was that liberal democracy and its associated capitalist economic system would become dominant because of two main factors. The first was that Humans want to live in a system that allows them to freely choose their beliefs and way of life. The second was that the dynamism and efficiency of capitalism, which was giving the West a winning wedge in the Cold War, both in living standards and high-tech weaponry, would pre prevail over communism. He therefore predicted that liberal democracy was the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. In those days, Fukuyama had become a, a superstar, and we all almost thought that as a result, other system of government, which still existed, would, would become irrelevant, and that there were no more wars, and that uh, the only prevailing political ideology would be uh, liberal democracy. Neither would there be any globally driven agenda to spread any political system because liberal democracy had settled any argument of utility in other systems. Unfortunately, this presentation by Fukuyama has been borne out not to be uh, exact. And in its roots of liberal hegemony, Godwin says, as, uh, this is a fundamentally flawed argument, as the world, for instance, has not been com completely peaceful as predicted. And liberal democracy is not on a match, as there are reasonably other attractive alternative models in our world today. I don't fully agree with that either. I'm not sure that they are attractive alternative 
models. But this was what one of the authors in criticizing Fukuyama thought that look, Fukuyama thought because capitalism, uh, liberal democracy was superior, not only in this form of governance, but in this manifestation in the way the economies run, and that life seemed more prosperous in the West, then it had become obviously the choice. I'm not sure that's what uh, has turned out to be. But to Fukuyama's credit, though, there was a wave of democratization across the world following the end of the Cold War. Of the 75 countries rated as autocracies in 1987, only 15 were still rated that way three decades later. Democratic indexes by other agencies, such as Freedom House and the Economic Intelligence Unit, point to similar trends of increased democratization of authoritarian regimes after the Cold War. Across Europe, the Soviet Union and Africa, countries held elections to transition from authoritarian rule to democracy. Notwithstanding the ubiquity of liberal democracy in this period, the adoption was by no means homogeneous. The democratization path of each country greatly impacted its eventual practice. As will be seen subsequently, these parts account for some of the democratic backsliding that the world has witnessed in recent times, especially in Africa. At this point, I will endeavor to set out the ideal reflection of, your, of a pure liberal democracy in order to highlight the dissimilar democratization that occurred within this period. William Gatson argued that liberal democracy as a political system borrows from four main concepts, the republic, democracy, constitutionalism, and liberalism. Put together, he, he characterizes liberal democracy as a political order that rests on the republican principle, takes constitutional form, incorporates the civ civic egalitarianism and majoritarian principles of democracy. It's apparent from this characterization that liberal democracy is a <clears throat> blend of various ideals and practices of significance also, <clears throat> sorry, is the recognition that these ideals have in practice evolved, taking on new manifestations alongside global evolution. To this end, the practice of liberal democracy in the US under Roosevelt or Churchill of Britain cannot be compared to present, present day democracy under Biden or Rishi. Some of these evolutionary phenomena are said also to contribute to the decline of liberal democracy itself. But before venturing into that assessment, the multi-layered character of the ideals of liberal democracy inherently conflicts with how some societies are organized culturally, religiously, socially, and politically, because there are certain forms of cultures or religions which inherently do not guarantee the forms of total freedoms which liberal democracy assumes or pretends to provide. This has stifled the propagation of liberal democracy and resulted in some countries who profess to be formally democratic, practicing some, but not all of the ideals. Consider the part of the Middle East dominated by the religious practice of Islam and Sharia law in a number of governments. While there's no doubt about the religion's respect for all persons, its conceptualization of equality is certainly asymmetric to that of liberal democracy. A case in point is the fact that uh, women cannot drive in Saudi Arabia, or that recently a young girl uh, with a hijab story in uh, Iran, and see how many people were imprisoned and died merely because they were trying to express themselves freely in public. In the face of these challenges, indexes such as full democracies, flawed democracies, hybrid democracies, and false democracies have been developed to sufficiently cover any country practicing some variant of democracy, albeit not perfect. In fact, the very existence 
of theoreticians who talk about flawed democracies, hybrid democracies, false democracies, testify to the fact that liberal democracy does not manifest itself in all so-called liberal democratic societies in the same manner. Now, I proceed to the first question of what is accounting for the disruption in liberal democracy and a slow but increasing democratic backsliding. Globalization and technology remain at the fore of liberal democracy's disruption. The globalization of the economy and of communication has eroded and disconstructed national economies and limited the capacity of the nation state to respond within its own ambit to problems that are global in origin, such as the financial crisis, such as human rights issues, such as climate change, such as the existing criminal financial networks or terrorism. The paradox, as I noted in my introduction, is that nation states practicing liberal democracy were themselves responsible for instigating the globalization process in the first place by dismantling regulation and borders. Professionals with better education and broader possibilities are connecting with each other across the, across the planet to form new kinds of social classes. This separates the cosmopolitan elites who create value in the global market Place from the local workers who are devalued by industrial offshoring and relocation. It goes, this goes further than that. The unfettered logic of the market clearly accentuates differences between capacities based on what is or is not useful to global capital networks, production and consumption. It's like that beyond mere inequality, we are seeing real polarization whereby the rich become richer, above all, at the very apex of the pyramid, and the poor even poor, poorer. This dynamic is played out both in national economies and on a global stage. It's like that despite hundreds of millions of people worldwide being lifted from poverty and integrated into new forms of industrialization to revitalize and broaden the global market, fragmentation within every society and between every country is becoming ever more acute. National governments, almost without exception, have chosen to hitch their wagons to globalization to avoid being left behind from the new economy and the new distribution of power. To increase the competitive capacity of their countries, they created a new form of state, the network base, based on the institutional articulation of nation states, which do not disappear but instead become nodes in a supranational network in which sovereignty is partly surrendered in exchange for the participation in managing globalization. The further nation states distance themselves, themselves from the nations they represent, the more the state and the nation dissociate from one another. This leads to a crisis of legitimacy in the minds of many citizens who are kept at the margins of the fundamental decisions that affect their lives, which are now, in their view, taken elsewhere, outside of institutions of direct representation. And this argument was very uh, aggressively made by Boris Johnson during the Brexit debate. On another hand, the digitalization of all data and the modal interconnection of messages have created a media universe in which we are all permanently immersed. Our construction of reality and cons consequently our behavior and decisions depend on the signals that we receive and exchange within that universe. Technology has placed decision makers in representative democracies under the prism of not only the people who elected them, but the entire world in respect of all their actions. The practice of foreign citizens showing solidarity to subjects of unpopular government, government actions have become common. And it is my suspicion that if social media was that active during the apartheid period, maybe apartheid would have ended much quicker. 
the delivery gap between citizens' expectations and outcomes of liberal democratic governments also accounts for the declining scale of liberal democracy. As one analyst puts it, contemporary liberal democracy rested on a tacit compact between peoples on the one hand and elected representatives together with unelected experts on the other. The people would defer to elites as long as they delivered sustained prosperity and steadily improving living standards. But if elites stopped managing the economy effectively, all bets were off. The long tradition of an elitist conception of democracy has for se several decades created the atmosphere for populists who pretend to be speaking on behalf of people who have been neglected and held in contempt by technocratic political and economic elites. In recent years, this tension has been worsened by a grow growing disconnect between the ruled and the, and the rulers. Across the West, liberal democracies are increasingly dominated by highly educated, this is not just across the West, in Africa too, highly educated and liberal elites whose backgrounds and outlook differ fundamentally from those of the average citizen, a development that has been exacerbated by the rise of a new governance elite, connected through informal and informal networks that cut across elected national governments. There's a gradual collapse of the political model of representation and governance. In recent years, we've seen extensive grassroots grassroot mobilizations against the current system of party politics and par parliamentary democracy under the slogan, they do not represent us. This is not about a rejection of democracy, but rather of liberal democracy, democracy as it exists in each country in the name of real democracy, as the, we saw with the Gilets Jaunes in France or with the Front National du the FNDC in Guinea, or Yanama in Ouagadougou, or Kinshasa. The consensus appears to be that the fundamental agents of politics, the political parties, although may differ in terms of policies, agree on maintaining their monopoly on power within the pre-established framework of possibilities. Politics is becoming professionalized and politicians are, be, are becoming a social group that defends their common interests above those of the people they purport to represent. They make up a political class that with honorable exceptions transcends ideologies and protects its oligopoly. Furthermore, by their very nature, since the 1920s, Robert, Robert Michels as, a, as argued that political parties naturally undergo a process of internal bureaucratization, limiting their renewal to leadership contests and dis distancing themselves from any oversight or decision making by their members. In most countries in the world today, and I mean in most countries in the world today, including in Europe, including the US, and including Africa, more than two-thirds of their population think that politicians do not represent them. The political parties, all of them, according to the citizens, prioritize their own interests, that the resulting parliaments are not representative, and that governments are unjust, bureaucratic, and oppressive. In the almost unanimous perception of citizens across the world, and I mean across the world, the most poorly viewed profession, guess who it is, is that of a politician. And all the more so because they seem endlessly, endlessly to reinvent themselves and rarely return to ordinary life as long as they can prosper among the winding little alleyways of politics. This widely held feeling of rejection of politics in its current form 
does differ in nature between countries and regions, but tends to be equitous. The African situation is troubling, even more troubling, as the delivery gap has not only led to a belief that elected representatives do not represent citizens, but is also actively cutting out the entire system of liberal democracy through coup d'etats, which were supposed to be a thing of the past. And West Africa's latest successful coups in Burkina, Guinea, and Mali has renewed an ease about coups ret returning and democracies receding in West Africa. The situation in Central Africa is not much better. Granted, it's only recently that uh, there was one coup in Chad. But regimes in these countries have tended to stay in power for too long in what is supposed to be uh, liberal democracies. In Brazil, Sassou Nguesso has been in power for 25 years. In Rwanda, Kagame has been in power for 22 years. In Cameroon, Paul Bia has been in power for 40 years. In Equatorial Guinea, Nguema has been in power for 43 years. And another factor that has contributed to the current democratic backsliding is the weak democratization process coupled with the authoritarian tendencies of democratic leaders. This problem is particularly prevalent in Africa. Notably, several of the democracies in Africa evolved out of nationalist movements and military uh, regimes. And some academics have noted that these countries, which lacked organized oppositions and very dynamic civil societies in their nascent democratic period, created dominant political heads during the transition to liberal democracy. These figures exercise excessive control, and you, you, we have plenty of examples in Africa, over the democratization process, M many a time preventing any true democratization in order to perpetuate their rule. This took the form of term amendments, as you've seen, attempts made in Guinea, and as you've seen, as happened in Cote d'Ivoire. And some of these amendments were to enable them either to contest further elections or to put in place skewed succession plans, sometimes in favor of relatives, as you saw with Elijah uh, Omar Bongo in Gabon and General Yedema in Togo. Some of these leaders pretend to practice democracy, but a lot of it remains superficial. That elections are held periodically, but without the crucial ingredients of democracy, like informed and active participation, respect for the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, and protection of civil liberties. As a result, their democracy is merely cosmetic, as even the, some of the elections are often characterized by intimidation, massive rigging, and monetization. Liberal democracy has been characterized as functionally ineffective in many parts of Africa. Its capacity to even prevent dictatorial rule has come under scrutiny, as I noted earlier. Within this context, liberal democracy has been criticized as being a creation of the West and suitable for practice in Africa. Hence, the need to consider alternative. This is an argument which President Kagame often makes in his television interviews. The perceived democratic illegitimacy among leaders has led to the generation of a discourse of fear and to political ideologies that propose going back to the drawing board, back to the state, and citizens at the center of decision making. Over elected elites, economic oligarchs, and global networks, they are clamoring to go back to the nation as a cultural community to the exclusion of anyone who does not share the values of those defined as native. They're asking us to go back to the patriarchal family unit as a primary institution of daily protection against a world in chaos. The new legitimacy 
which also promises an utopia through a rapture with a deep-rooted institutional order and with a culture of the cosmopolitan elites. This is the common thread running through the diverse protests and developments transforming the established political order in different countries. And we find it in the improbable rise of, to power of a character like uh, Trump. We find it in the unthinkable secession of the UK from the European Union. We find it again in the recent elections of what I describe as a pro Mussolini extreme right wing leader in Italy. Today, the ravages of Brexit, coupled with other global happenings, have left the British economy in the throes of astronomical energy prices, highest cost of living in decades, high interest rate, a shortage of workers in jobs elsewhere dying by EU immigrants. And number 10 Downing Street has become a short-term hotel. <laughs> Recently, I've seen three prime ministers within three months and four chancellors from number 11 Downing Street within four months, unfortunately, including our own brother, Agassi Kwati. It is apparent that the promise of a new utopia and a disruption of the prevailing democratic structures endears to citizens looking for alternatives, even if they have no guarantee of the outcomes of such new systems. So what are some of the alternatives? And I've intentionally limited myself to two main ones. In certain areas of the world, particularly China and Russia, authoritarian regimes have established themselves as effective alternatives to liberal democracy. The Middle East is governed either by, by theocracies in countries such as Iran and Saudi Arabia or dictatorships in Egypt and Syria, apart from Israel, which exists in a constant state of war with its occupied territories. In Europe, neo-fascist movements have sprung up in Poland, in Hungary, in Romania, Bulgaria, and even in Germany as an identity-driven reaction against the European Union. Among the plethora of alternatives, populism and authoritarian regimes with supposed strong leaderships have been touted to best remedy the fault lines of democracy. Critics argue that liberals have prioritized individuals at the expense of the community, have focused too heavily on dry, transactional, and technocratic debates, and have lost sight of national allegiances whilst obsessing over the transnational ones. National populists, on the other hand, prioritize the culture and interests of the nation and promise to give voice to a people who feel that they have been neglected, even held in contempt by distant and often corrupt elites. National populist leaders feed on this deep dissatisfaction, but their path into the mainstream has also been cleared by the weakening bonds between the traditional mainstream, mainstream parties and the, and the people, or what we refer to as de-alignment. The classic era of liberal democracy was characterized by relatively stable politics, strong mainstream parties, loyal voters. We've seen it now come to an end. Many people are no longer strongly aligned to the mainstream and the bonds are breaking. This de-alignment is making political systems across the world far more volatile, fragmented, and more unpredictable than at any point in, uh, in our history. Politics, politics today feels more chaotic and less predictable than in the past because it is. This trend too was a long time coming and it still has a long way to run. Some national po uh, populist leaders like Viktor Orban even speak of a new form of illiberal democracy that raises worrying issues about democratic rights and the demonization of immigrants. 
However, most national populist voters strangely want even more democracy. They want more referendums and more empathetic and listening politicians who give more power to the people and less power to established economic and political elites. National populism also raises legitimate democratic issues that millions of people want to discuss and address. They question the way in which elites have become more and more insulated from the lives and concerns of ordinary people. They question the erosion of the nation state, which they see as the only construct that has proven capable of organizing our political and social life. They also question the capacity of many Western societies to rapidly absorb rates of immigration and hyper-ethnic change that are largely unprecedented in the history of modern civilization. They question cosmopolitan and globalizing agendas, asking where these are taking us and what kinds of societies we want to create. And some of them ask whether all religions support key aspects of modern life in the West, such as equality and respect for women. Recently, I'm sure you've noticed what the UN Supreme Court is doing about abortion. There's absolutely no doubt some, that some national populists veer into racism and xenophobia, especially towards Muslims. But this should not distract us from the fact that they also tap into widespread and legitimate public anxieties across a range of different areas. From this lens, populism is not a threat to democracy itself, but rather to the dominant liberal variant of democracy. Among the four key components of liberal democracy, which I discussed earlier, populism also accepts the principles of popular sovereignty and democracy well understood in a straightforward fashion as the exercise of majoritarian power. However, populism remains cynical about constitutionalism to the extent that formal bounded institutions and procedures obstruct majorities from working their will. The challenge with populism is the assumption of homogeneity in, in the will, judgments, and values of the people. This assumption of uniform virtues of the people results in the expression of dissent being labeled as an enemy of the people. The reality remains that within the masses, desires and wants are not uniform, making it difficult to act in a manner that will always be popular. In the end, what becomes the will of the people is likely to be tainted by the will of the leaders of such populist movements. On another hand, Authoritarian regimes have been around as long as liberal democracy itself. There is abundant evidence on its benefits and harms. The incorporation of elections into modern authoritarian regimes do not detract from the dangers it presents given the concentration of power in the hands of such leaders. Liberal democracy has shown that civil liberties without economic prosperity leads to public outcry and the search for alternative systems of government. However, economic prosperity without civil liberties also leads to revolts for just and equal societies. Thus, the utopias promised by these alternatives exclude particularly room for dissent, an area which liberal democracy, even in its worst form, caters for. The other danger with these alternatives is that they are often built around personalities. And until we discover the elixir of immortality, we are unable to predict how long the system will endure after the demise of the strong man. However you look at it, liberal democracy appears to provide a better and enduring vehicle for participation in government, governance and economic success. Before sharing my concluding statement, I've, I've noticed in the literature that a number of recommendations have been made by many scholars regarding challenges hindering the growth of liberal democracy in Africa. These include, but not 
are not limited to the importance of constitutional reforms, civic education of citizens to demand accountability from governments, the strengthening of anti-corruption institutions, the promotion of inclusive politics, the institutionalization of preventive diplomacy and conflict resolution, the targeted efforts to increase women and youth representatives in government while addressing the threat of violent extremism and terrorism. Finally, the reform of the existing United Nations Peace and Security Architecture. So I come back to the two questions I asked at the beginning of this lecture. Is it the case that the transformation needed, if any, will require a new system of democracy? Well, my simple and simplistic answer is yes. Transformation is required, but the fault lines which we have identified in this lecture will continue to exist. And the failure of liberal democratic countries to remedy these fault lines only provide more capital for emerging alternatives to subvert liberal democracy itself. What then, what would that new system of democracy look like? And how can societies build consensus for that change? My response, simplistic though it might be, is as follows. That new democracy must be even more democratic in the sense that its institutions must be more representative, less distant from the deep interests of the societies they represent. It must also be less elit elitist in outlook while taking into account some of the pertinent concerns expressed by nationalist groups. Liberal Democrats must recognize that a focus on economic growth does not automatically result in a fair distribution of wealth across social status. And all inclusive growth must therefore be deliberately pursued to avoid the deepening classism created within the current system. Finally, liberal democratic institutions must work towards quicker delivery of outcomes. In this presentation, I tried to recount the better circumstances of liberal democracy, its practice after the Cold War, and the challenges currently being encountered many decades later. I have highlighted the growing discontent among elected representatives and the electorates, the impacts of globalization and technology in alienating the average citizen from governance, and at the same time, arming them to better influence the elected representatives. I've tried to demonstrate the effect of continuous insulation of citizens that has resulted in unexpected outcomes in global politics, particularly cases like that of Trump, Brexit, and the return of coup in Africa, leading to the emergence of new movements seeking to fill the void left by liberal de democracy. I've considered two of these alternatives, national populism and authoritarian regimes, and assess their claim of being better and the dangers, dangers they represent in the current dispensation. In sum, I've sought to say that the promises of liberal democracy at the end of the Cold War and its returns have compelled the reconsideration of other political ideologies or systems contrary to the predictions of Fukuyama at the end of the Cold War. Since I'm very mindful of the times we are in, I must clarify that I'm not saying that liberal democracy has failed beyond redemption. Neither am I saying that any of the emerging alternatives, such as authoritarian rule or populism, presents a better chance of remedying the pitfalls of liberal democracy. democracy. In fact, available evidence indicates that despite the widespread dissatisfaction with the performance of democratic institutions in Europe and North America, the median support for representative democracy stands at 80%, although about 70% also support referendums in which citizens will be voting directly on major national issues. I wish to conclude by agreeing with an observation by a senior fellow of Brookings Institution. And he says, 
The liberal democracy is fragile. It's constantly threatened, always in need of repair. But liberal democracy is also strong because to a greater extent than any other political form, it harbors the power of self-correction. Not only do liberal democratic institutions protect citizens against, against tyrannical concentrations of power, they also provide mechanisms for challenging the public's grievances and unmet needs into effective reforms. Human choice, not historical inevitability, will determine liberal democracy's fate. I'm grateful for your invitation and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Please take your seats while still showing appreciation to our distinguished alumnus. Ambassador D.K. Osei, we are so proud of you and we are very grateful to you for deepening our knowledge about liberal democracy. Thank you very, very much. Before we move on, I'll continue with the a number of people that I need to introduce here, a number of personalities. We are happy to be joined by Mr. Jude Arthur, board chair of GCB Bank PLC. And we also have here with us the Indian High Commissioner, His Excellency Mr. Sudan. We also have Ambassador Ahmed Hassan with us here. And so do we have Ambassador Isaac Osei with us. Additionally, we have the former Commissioner of Shiraz, Justice Emil Short with us. And we also have the Executive Director of IDEC, Mr. Emmanuel Akwiti. And we are privileged to have Nana Kwejo Jume Bene, who is the MD of Universal Merchant Bank, also here with us. I think the staff and students of Presec and Achimota have been introduced and we, we are so grateful you made time to join us. Thank you very much. We we'll continue to acknowledge some more people as we move on to the presentations, but let me also mention that we are happy to have the family of our distinguished lecturer here with us. Please give us a wave. So we now move on to presentations. We will first of all invite the UG Alumni Association Council to do their presentation.
Our lecturer is an alumnus of a Kuafu Hall. And so both the master and senior tutor are here together with some representatives from Ekwafo Hall, and I invite them to make their presentation. We continue with the presentations. Ambassador D.K. Ose completed Achimota School in 1968. I wonder how many of us were born then. <laughs> and we are privileged to have OAA 1968 year group here to make a presentation. Together with other members of OAA, other Accras, Some of the students can join, please. Select a few, two or four to join for the presentation. has been sung so many times here in this hall that I now know the tune. I only have to learn the lyrics and then I'm done. So we we'll now invite UMB, Universal Merchants Bank, to make a presentation. To UMB, Ambassador DK Osei is their very, very valued customer.
thanks very much to you all. We are so very appreciative of you. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, please help me to invite our chairperson, Professor Nana Bapia Amfo, to deliver her closing remarks. Thank you, Director of Public Affairs. And a very special thank you to our lecturer for this evening, Ambassador DK Osei DK, for delivering such an informative and stimulating lecture. If I simplified the title of his lecture, I would say it's Liberal Democracy, the Pros and Cons simply put, and he's delivered it so brilliantly and gave a very succinct summary. I would not attempt to even summarize, but as a student of politics, I took a lot of notes, and there are a few points that I want to reiterate even as we bring our session to a close. So essentially, Ambassador reminded us of the different forms of governance around the world and in our country, highlighting on the dominance and the appetite for liberal democracy around the world. And he made a point about liberal democracies, that liberal democracies ought to be adapted to reflect tradition, culture, religion, and so on. And so, Ambassador, maybe that's exactly what we are doing in Africa, where our leaders, in certain cases, will amend constitutions, as you mentioned, so we stay long <laughs> in power and have skewed uh, successions in favor of our family members. I don't know if this is good or bad for us, reflecting some of the things that we have been used to. But I think that an important point that Ambassador made was that these days, many governments do not have the luxury to wait till elections to give account to the people who have elected them into power. And this is especially true in this age of the new media. Uh, not too long ago, we heard and we saw a demonstration in our own country. They said it was Kumi Prekon, reloaded. Right. A good friend of mine who is in our audience today did a piece on that, and he thought that it was a Sreme Prekon, because they anticipated hype didn't turn out to be the case. But I also read a critique on his piece, which because he was making comparisons to the original Kumi Prekon, you know, and the crowds that it attracted. But the critique on his piece also said that he probably didn't take into consideration the options that we have today, and that we can talk about people expressing themselves in the media, on the social media, and so perhaps they didn't see the need to come out into the streets in the numbers as anticipated. But all in all, I think that all of these things just reinforces what Ambassador DK Osei said, that in whatever form of liberal democracy that we are practicing, there's a need for us to constantly reform these, to reflect the needs of our society. Yes, we like the civil liberties, but we also want to see the economic prosperity. I think one without the other will not give the needed satisfaction to our citizens. So Ambassador, thank you for giving us such food for thought. I believe that these thoughts will engage us and we will keep discussing these as we go away from here. All we want to see 
at least what I want to see is a society where our civil liberties are guaranteed and also a prosperous one where we can put food on the table, our children can go to school, we can have decent jobs, we can have decent amenities, and it doesn't matter which part of the country you live in. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for stimulating our minds this evening. And uh, th there were certain things that I learned about him today that I didn't know. And I'm sure for those of us, especially um, the younger ones, <laughs> indeed we learned a few things. I did not know that you were a record-setting athlete. <laughs> and you have such long-standing records. Well, I, I see my uh, SRC president here, I see the Grassack president here. Well, this is a very long-standing record. I challenge you, the, long, the younger ones, to, to see whether you can beat this. It's been so many years. Ambassador, congratulations. And finally, I would like to thank you for the fact that Today, you've brought so many people here from various walks of life. Uh, right from people who have been active through the 60s up until date. I mean, we see the, the ancient and the modern, the young, the old, the in-between. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I would like to invite you all to the series of public lectures that we have outlined for our anniversary. As I mentioned earlier in my introductory remarks, you can see these on pages 16 and 17 on the brochure. Look out for our announcements. Join us physically if you can. If you cannot, join us virtually because indeed we always cherish your presence and your patronage. Thank you all very much and have a good night. And we thank you very much as well, Madam Chairperson and Vice Chancellor. We thank you very much for chairing such an important lecture this evening. I'm happy to inform you that we've been live on Radio Universe 105.7, as well as on the Facebook and YouTube platforms of the University of Ghana Alumni Association. As we proceed, we will take the vote of thanks, but before we invite the one who moved the vote of thanks, I'm inviting Parakwesi Yankee here once more to perform a very special duty. Please, let's welcome. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, today I have said so many thank yous it started early this morning. And I'll continue saying thank you because those were the two words that my dear mother, late mother, taught me to say. Thank you. I would like, on behalf of the chairman of the Alumni Association and the council members to say a big thank you to the Bank of Ghana Goyle, GCB, Kofi, and Jude, they are here in persons. VRA, we have sent our thanks through Brother Richie to them. ADB, UMB, KPMG, CBG, Donaldo, where are you? ZPE, Sunu Assurances, Backpress. 
media houses, I'd like to say thank you to the Graphic Communications, the Daily Guide, that is the Western publication, City FM, Multimedia Group. I would also like to say a thank you in advance to Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority. They promised to give us a huge sum of money. <laughs> so do Fidelity Bank would also like to say thank you to them. So on that note, I would like to say Thank you to everybody, that's all who have helped to make this program a big success. Thank you very much on behalf of the University of Ghana Alumni Association. And thank you also for your able chairmanship. We are very grateful to you. At this point, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair, I'm happy to invite Dr. Sita Jacobs to move the vote of thanks for us. Please, let's welcome him. Good evening. Honorable Shelley Ayakoboche, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ghana, all dignitaries, special guests, our numerous sponsors present and represented, eminent guest speaker, Ambassador D.K. Osei, Honorable Chairperson, Professor Nanaba Apia Amfo, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, respected Chairperson of the University of Ghana Alumni Association, Doris Kesiwa Ansa distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Respectfully, I also wish to associate myself with the existing protocols as observed. It is my privilege to have been asked to give the vote of thanks for this year's University of Ghana Alumni Lectures. So, on behalf of the University of Ghana Alumni Association, the entire university community, and on my own behalf, I first and foremost give thanks to God Almighty for making it possible to have such a glorious occasion. I also extend my most hearty thanks to all of you for gracing this important event with your presence this evening. I'd like to thank our speaker, Ambassador D.K. Osei, for demonstrating such excellence in presenting the topic, liberal democracy, the new utopias, and the age of disorder. This is a topic which most of us will undoubtedly find particularly relevant interesting and thought-provoking. We are very much challenged and well-informed by the light you have thrown on it. We are most grateful to you, sir, for your brilliant exposition. I must also mention our deep appreciation to the Vice Chancellor for her much less organization and support for the alumni lectures. Madam, we are indeed very grateful. Furthermore, we are grateful to the chairperson and council members of the University of Ghana Alumni Association for being the bedrock of this lecture series year after year. Well done, council members. I would also like to place on record our immense gratitude to all our numerous sponsors and partners who tirelessly support us financially and otherwise to make this occasion successful. We are forever grateful to you. The chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, a huge event like this one doesn't happen overnight. We've been fortunate to have had the cooperation of a strong team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues of the university, the press, the media, technical and protocol staff who have helped to make this occasion a memorable one. We thank you all very much from the depth of our hearts. Finally, Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we are most grateful to you all gathered in this hall and elsewhere around the world to witness this event. We thank you for being with us this evening, and it's been a pleasure hosting you. May we proceed in truth and integrity to make Legon and our nation proud. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.
Let's show, show our appreciation to her once more. <laughs> Dr. Jacob Squashi is a member of the UG Alumni Council. Thanks very much, Doc. Before we file out of here, a couple of announcements, please. The Vice Chancellor and Chair has already invited all of us to take photographs by our 75th anniversary logo. And I would like to reiterate that when we file out, do not forget to take pictures by the logo and share on your social media platforms. For the order of recession, we'll have the platform party recess first, followed by our invited guests, and then the rest of us will follow. For the order of refreshments, the special invited guests will join the Alumni Council and our Vice Chancellor at the Vice Chancellor's Lodge. And then other guests, faculty, staff, students will take refreshments at the four courts, AA Kwapon Quadrangle. That's the four courts of the Great Hall. At this point, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please let's rise for the university anthem, which is on, you'll find the lyrics on page 19 of the brochure. <laughs> 